Hello and welcome to the session. This is Professor Farhat. In this session, we're going to be looking at the International Accounting Standard Board or IASP. And we're going to be looking specifically for going from harmonization to talking about convergence. In the prior session, we looked at harmonization. Now with the International Accounting Standard Board, we're going to shift to the concept of convergence. This topic is covered in international accounting and you do need to know something about the AISP for the CPA exam. As always, I would like to remind you, my viewers, to connect with me on a professional level. If you don't have a LinkedIn account, you should create a LinkedIn account. It's very good for your professional image and networking ability. YouTube is why, where I list all my lectures. Please subscribe to my channel so you're always up to date. Like my, like my videos, share them, put them in playlists, let the world know about them. If you're benefiting from my videos, there's somebody else out there who might benefit as well. This is my Instagram account. Please follow me in, on Instagram as I'm trying to grow my Instagram and accounting lectures is my Facebook handle. I do have a Gumroad where I have some premium CPA material. So let's talk about the IASP. Well, in the prior lectures, if you, if you didn't look at the prior lecture, what we do is we talked about the IASC, not B, the International Accounting Standard Committee. And if you remember what we talked about, we said that committee faced some challenges. And here are the challenges listed here. They lack legitimacy due to being created by accounting profession. They, they were accused of having self-interest. They lack legitimacy due to part-time members not selected for technical exper expertise. They had some problem with the International Accounting uh, Federation try to control the IASC twice and they failed. And also the most important, in my opinion, FASB position. FASB is the US position toward harmonization. And what we said, we said when FASB did a study, they find out that the international accounting standard differ 74% of the time versus US gap, US gap. And we're talking that's 1996, which is over 20 years ago. But the point that they differ that much, FASB said, no, we're not going to adapt your standard. We have a lot of work to do. So that's why the IASC was replaced with the IASB. And we, we changed the focus from, convert, from harmonization to convergence, which we need to talk about convergence a little bit more in the session, as well as the IASB. Now, the IASP is organized under an independent foundation called the IFRS Foundation, the International Reporting Standard Foundation. Now, let's take a look at the structure real quick of the IASP. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the role of each member of the structure, but you don't have to know this unless you, you're interested in this, but I'm going to talk real quick about it. And some people might say, well, you, you, you're, you, you're talking too much. Well, on the top, we have the um, mentoring board. What, what's the mentoring board? It oversees the whole foundation. Basically, it's on the top. It's uh, it's compromise of relevant leaders, for example, relevant leaders from the EU, um, US, SEC, um, uh, the International Securitization, um, the Japanese Financial Service Agency. So you have a different, a different, uh, a, di a different voices representative. It participate in trustee nomination, because we need to have trustee and we need to have trustee to run the foundation, it nominate those trustees and approve the appointments of those trustees. Then we have the IFRS foundation, basically the monitoring board, think of it as, as it's a monitoring board, the overseas thing. But the IFRS foundation is the foundation where you have the trustee and the role of the trustee, we have, first of all, we have 22 trustees, they are appointed they uh, oversee the IF, the board, and they raise funds for the board, okay? They represent different geographical areas, so you have people from North America, I believe six from North America, six from Europe, six from Asia, and four from other countries, so it's six, 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 18 plus four, 22, that's 22. And its composition is, uh, it's a balance of professional people, backgrounds and auditing, uh, users of financial statements, preparers of financial statements, uh, academicians, as well as other officials serving the public interest. And you need this diversity because remember one of the, one of the complaint against the IASC, is they were all mostly self, uh, self-appointed accountant. So that's, that's why it, you would see that diversity. So the, the trustee, um, have the responsibility, obviously, of appointing the board, the board of the IASC, which we're going to talk about a little bit more, uh, appoint the board, 
and establish their contract of service and performance criteria. Okay. And obviously, if they appoint the board, it means they're going to oversee this process as well. Okay. Let's talk about the board a little bit because the board is important because this is where, this is where basically people who are really working on setting the technical agenda, approving the standards, so on and so forth. The board is composed of 16 members, three part time and 13 full time. And again, one of the complaints against the IASC is they were mostly part-time, so they did not have a vested interest. Here, once they are selected by the foundation, 13 of them, the majority of them, they commit to working on the board. Okay, so it consists of 16 members. Um, they, they come from different countries. I believe I have a slide that talks about this. 16 members, 13 are full-time. Uh, board members are selected on the basis of professional competency and practical experience. Again, this was a complaint against the AASC. IASC. Now the board is has practical. Um, the members have practical experience and professional competency, and they expect to represent different geographical mix and to ensure a broad role of international diversity. Again, since July, we have four members from Asia, uh, Asia Oceania region. Uh, four members from Europe, four members from North America, one member from Africa, one member from uh, South America, and two members appointed from any area subject to maintaining overall geographical balance. So notice it has a balance. The, the, the members are competent, they are professional, and they commit to it full time. The board follows asserting um, a due process and issuing IFRS. And again, this is highlighted here. This is the most important statement. I overlooked it. Is the IASB, its sole responsibility is to establish what we're going to be learning in this chapter is the International Financial Reporting Standard. That's that's the board that issue those standards. So this is basically the center the center of things, the center of things. Now we have interpretation committee uh, in case you need any, um, if you need uh, any help interpreting the standard, we have advisory council, basically helping, helping the foundation, helping the board. We have other working groups. So if you're interested in the structure, you could read about them or you could visit their website. If that's what you are, if, if, if that, if that's of interest to you, but that's the only thing I'm going to talk about the A IASB structure. So let's talk about convergence because this is what the IASB set to do, set, set to create convergence. Now we have to accept that the IASB earned a great deal of goodwill from interested parties, um, accounting standard setting, securities regulation across the globe, um, uh, geographical blocks like the EU, uh, FASB, so on and so forth. So what, what is convergence? Because co convergence could mean many things. So we're going to look at convergence from the three different perspectives. The first perspective is a strict viewpoint of convergence. It refers to the enforcement of a single set of accepted standard by several regulatory bodies. So what's going to happen? You could look at convergence as, well, we're going to have one set of single set and everybody will have to accept it. That's that's called the, the strict viewpoint. Another viewpoint, a softer viewpoint, it referred to diminishing, diminishing differences, kind of more than harmonization, but it's diminishing differences among accounting, accounting standard issued by several regulatories. So basically, rather than it's it's more than harmonization, but it's not. It doesn't take that strict viewpoint. And the third point of view, it referred to a situation where two or more jurisdictions agree on a core set of common standard allowing variant interpretation regarding non-core issues. So we agree on the core standards and the minor issues as far as convergence, it's up to each jurisdiction to deal with it. So that's, that's also could be considered a convergence. Now, it differ. What, what are you looking for? For example, we might have a strict viewpoint on revenue recognition, softer viewpoint on other areas. So, but th that's what convergence could could possibly mean, okay? But also the implementation of convergence is important. How the IASB implementing convergence? Also, they have three approaches. One approach is to merge all standard setting bodies into a unified global body. Theoretically, this is the most optimal. Basically, you have one accounting body, you have no national bodies. That doesn't exist yet, okay? But that's in theory. If that's how you want to create convergence, and this basically this this goes hand in hand with the strict viewpoint, where you only have one set of accepted standard. The second one is recognize each of the existing stand, standard setting bodies as a sole authority in its representative jurisdiction, and give them discretion and flexibility in accounting standard through mutual recognition, which is theoretically more desirable than uniformity and rigidity. So basically, this 
this implementation state that guess what we are going to let you do what you want to do okay that's not a problem at all we're going to give you discretion and flexibility but you're going to recognize so so you're going to have mutual recognition so what i do is accepted by you and what you do is accepted by me the third way is national standard uh, setting body can coexist with international coordination bodies so basically we still have the national standard body and they coexist with the international coordination body and this is basically what we have technically right now number three is the closest thing to what we have to what we have right now okay so but overall we have to understand that the main objective is to is to achieve convergence now how we're going to be achieving convergence one way to describe one way the best way to describe it is by the former the, the former chairman of the AASB sir david tweedy he basically said what we're going to do the strategy is to identify the best standard around the world and build a body of accounting standard that constitute the highest common denominator of financial reporting so what would you think the best standard around the world would be obviously they will be from well-developed countries like the us the U and the eu so that's what they want to do and build 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 the standard around the most common denominator now bear in mind the the iasb has adopted a principle based approach and this is important it's important because in the us we 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 did not use principle based based approach because we use rule based approach what's rule based basically rule based means we give you a lot of guidance we give you a lot of guidance this is how you do this this is how you do that principle based is we give you a principle then it's up to you how you implement the principle so the us did accept this this is a great um, a great um, a great step in the uh, in the uh, in the process of convergence they adopted a, we adopted a principle based approach to standard setting and that's very important that's very important versus rule based but what's basically is a principle based what, what does that mean it means it means the the ifrs they will establish general principles for recognition measurement financial reporting and they would limit the guidance so what's going to happen is they will give you the principle and it's your judgment your professional judgment and how to apply this general principle to your entity or to your industry a case in point is the revenue recognition principle for example the revenue recognition principle is accepted um, in the us accepted in europe it's the same principle but how a european company will implement it might be different of how a u.s company might implement it although they're looking at the same principle the implementation might be might be different okay let's take a look at the major concern in achieving ifrs convergence so what are the major concern or basically obstacles that 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 could hinder this process well the complicated nature of particular standards especially those that deals with fair value accounting financial instruments and fair value accounting even within gap we have issues with fair value accounting what's fair value accounting fair value accounting means you have to report your assets specifically financial assets and financial liabilities as well as other assets and liabilities at fair value fair value means how much they are worth today now how do you determine how much something is worth today for some some assets that's really easy if you have equity if you have stocks if you have apple stocks if you have amazon if you have walmart well it's easy to find out what's the fair value of that financial instrument but if you own a building if you own a piece of land how do you know what's the fair value well that that's a complicated nature of uh, of of uh, of a particular standard how do we agree how do we agree on how to find the fair value well there is guidance but it's not necessarily it's it, it's the same across the board or it's that's not how everybody implement not everybody implement it the same way also countries with tax driven national accounting regime for example in some countries that's all they have one one accounting system and that's the tax system now what you're doing is you're imposing ifrs and you're telling them you have to use IFRS for your taxation and their taxation might be based on different factors cultural factors political factors economic factors now you're bringing IFRS and you're imposing it on them that's a difficulty that's a difficulty in implementing disagreement with certain significant IFRS especially those related again to fair value accounting again within gap we have disagreement on fair value accounting also a difficulty is insufficient guidance on first time application of ifrs for example when you first convert how am i going to convert from my national local gap generally accepted accounting principle to this ifrs system so it's going to be some difficulties also for countries with limited cap market capital 
I'm not benefiting from IFRS. Why should I change my system? It might be cost me money. I, I don't need I don't need your uh, capital market. I have no companies that are raising money on Wall Street or raising money in Tokyo or raising money in uh, in in London. Uh, so why do I have to uh, adopt this IFRS? Okay. Also, I could be happy with my national accounting standard. Why are you imposing this on me? Okay. So user. Invest, invest, uh, investor slash user satisfaction with the current national uh, accounting standard. Also, we could have language translation difficulties because IFRS is initially written in English. And sometimes they're finding difficulties finding a direct translation for certain words. So that's that's also a difficulty, and this could be um, th this could create some problems for some culture. They don't we they don't maybe, maybe they don't like to use the English word. They like to use their their language. Okay. Um, although the FRS has been translated in over 30 different languages, but there are certain words you may not find direct translation. Now, let's talk about argument for international convergence. Why uh, convergence? Why do we need to convert? What are the reasons? Well, we talked about them, but let's go ahead and review, kind of put it in a, uh, in, in a, in a nutshell. Uh, facilitate better comparability of financial statement. And that's the, that's usually what we start with. We want the same financial statement across the globe. Why? Because it's going to make it easier for potential investors to look at your company and invest in your company. That's one of the reasons. So to facilitate comparability. So if I am in, uh, if I am in uh, South Africa, I look at the financial statements of a company in Europe, I would understand the financial statements. And if I have some money, I might invest in that company because I understand their financial statements since they are using the same system that I'm using in South Africa. So it's easy. Okay, facilitate international mergers and acquisition. Well, otherwise, what's going to happen if you don't have the same set of financial statements every time you need to buy a company, international company, you're going to have to do, you're going to have to translate your financial statements, do more diligence because they're using a different system. So it, it, in a sense, it benefits large companies. Reduce financial reporting cost. You just have one system and you could use this system for cross listing. So you could be listed in the in, in New York, in Tokyo and in London. OK, so cross listing would uh, would would allow access to less expensive capital uh, because there is less risk. Uh, reduce investor uncertainty and the cost of capital. Well, the, the, the less uncertainty is the less the risk. So think about it. If you are looking at the financial statements and you understand everything, your uncertainty goes down. Every time risk goes down, cost goes down because whoever's looking at your financial statements, they're taking less risk because they understand what you are communicating in the income statement and the balance sheet and the cash flow statement. Well, rest, less risk for me. Well, I'm willing to take more chance and I'm willing to invest more money. Reduce the cost of preparing worldwide consolidated financial statements again. If you have one system, it doesn't matter. Then you can transfer your accounting staff from one, one, one area to the other. And it's simplify auditing. If you're, if for everybody using the same accounting system, the auditor can understand financial statements across the globe. Okay. And overall, raise the quality level of accounting practices internationally. And that's another reason. Uh, maybe, maybe again, this could be a colonial point of view. It could be an imposing point of view, but, uh, the quality of accounting practices in certain countries is not as good. Maybe if they adopt the I I IFRS, they would raise the quality. So it, it increased the credibility of their financial information. It enabled developing countries to adopt ready-made set of high quality standard with minimum cost of effort. Now you don't have to create your own standard, just adopt ours and you are good to go. So you don't need any cost. Just learn how to work with ours. Now, since we talked about arguments for, to be fair, we have to talk argument against. So what are the argument against international convergence? What are some of the argument? Well, significant differences exist and will always exist. So it's going to be enormous political cost to eliminate those differences, especially cultural, cultural differences. Also, you have nationalism and tradition. Okay, arriving at universally accepted principle might be difficult. What's what what's what's accepted for you may not accept it for me. That means it's right or wrong. It just I, I don't accept this concept. Okay, uh, the need for common standard is not universally accepted. Well developed global capital already exists. So why do we need a, uh, a common standard? Well, if you want to raise money in the in the global capital market. The global capital market already exists. They can discount your information. They can convert your information if they're interested in investing in your company. Also, it might cause standard overload. They may have, you know, it may or may not. You may have so many rules. 
Also, differences in accounting across countries might be necessary. Well, guess what? Differences is good. The way you do things, it's different than the way I do things because my background is different than yours. Um, my requirements are different than yours. Therefore, differences exist. Let's have different accounting standards. That's another, that's another argument. Even within the US, I mean, if you really think about it, even in the US itself, we have something called big big gap versus small gap so big gap versus small gap a lot of companies they don't like to comply with everything that gap asks you to do generally accepted accounting principle so we have big gap and small gap so for smaller companies we we do allow them in certain circumstances to use different rules well if you think about it if you're talking within the same country the US think about globally you may you may need big off what do we need a big IFRS and a small IFRS it's interesting, but that's something for you to think about. And eventually, as you practice, you will do, especially if you practice in multi, with multinational corporation, you will start to appreciate the differences as well as the similarities. And you could really form your own opinion whether we do need one set of accounting standard or we don't need one set of accounting standard or some compromise in between. Uh, this is basically my, uh, the, uh, my lecture about the IASB. If you happen to visit my website for additional lectures, please consider donating. Good luck and study hard.